the verse I wanted to look at there was a verse 21 where the Bible read, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. That's a pretty scary verse when you read it. It's talking about children actually causing their parents to be put to death. I mean, what causes that? What, is, what could be something that would make children go to such extremes? Go to uh, Jeremiah chapter number 4. There's another verse in the Bible in Proverbs 30. It says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. So according to the Bible, there's generations that hate their parents. This is not even found in multiple places. In Matthew chapter 10, we see the primary reason these people are, are against their parents is for Christ's name's sake, is what the Bible says. Because they're Christian, because they have the testimony of the Lord, they hate them. But if you have godly parents, if you have Christian parents who love the Lord, who are wanting to serve the Lord, how is it that their children hate them? How is it their children are against them? They even want them to be put to death. What could possibly cause that? Well, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So according to the Bible, if you want your children to turn out well, if you want them to be trained in the right, you want them to go in the right ways, you need to train up the children in those right ways. So how in the world do they become bad? Well, I think it's because you're not training up the children. You're not spending the time with the children. You're not working for your children. You're not doing things for your children. You're not teaching. You're not training your children. And the title of my sermon this evening is Parental Outsourcing. Parental Outsourcing. I think one major cause for what we could see where a generation would rise up and hate their parents. This is not the only reason, but this is one reason. is because we see so many parents today, they outsource the job of a parent. They get rid of all the responsibilities of what a parent should be doing, the role of a parent, the importance of a parent, and they give it to somebody else. They give it to tons of different people, but they themselves do not want to be the parent. They do not take responsibility in the role of a parent. They just outsource it. Now, a lot of companies today, they, they like to do outsourcing, and outsourcing is not necessarily wrong in and of itself, but when it's your job to be a parent according to the Bible, when the Bible's giving you clear instruction to train up your child, it's not for you to just then outsource that to somebody else. And there's a lot of bad consequences to that. It says in Malachi 4, it's talking about John the Baptist, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So according to the Bible, John the Baptist has come to set the love between a father and a son back to, back to the right. Back to where there's love. He says when the parents and the children are at enmity, there's a curse on the earth. There's a curse when children do not love their parents. It's a curse in the land. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. And they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. What is America like today? It's full of sottish children. You say, what's a sot? What's someone who's sottish? Well, if you look up in the dictionary, it says a habitual drunk. Someone that doesn't take life seriously. Some synonyms to this would be doltish or stupid. If you look up the word dolt, it just says a stupid person. What is our society filled with? It's filled with stupid people. People that don't care about God, don't care about righteousness, don't care about godliness. They're just stupid and foolish and wasting their life. They're ruining their lives. And you say, why are so many people doing this? It's because their parents aren't teaching them the right ways. Their parents have outsourced all of the instruction from the Bible to other people, and they're teaching them bad things. They're teaching them the, the wisdom of this world they're teaching them how to do evil, yeah. not how to do good. You know, the Bible says, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. The Bible says it's not good to be stupid. It's not good to be doltish. It's not good to be habitual junk, a drunk. That's going to bring a lot of shame unto you. Shame is a painful emotion that causes guilt. It says it's a condition of humiliating disgrace or disrepute. People should be ashamed today of being stupid. 
of being a drunk, of being worthless, of just causing their life to just have no meaning. We see today people are proud to be stupid a lot of times. They're proud of all their ignorance. They're proud of all their vanity. They're proud of being a drunk. They don't want to, they, they make fun of people that are smart. That's not what the Bible teaches. Go if you would to Ezekiel chapter 18. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 7, And be not ye like your fathers, and like your brethren, which transpassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. Now according to the Bible, we are supposed to honor and respect our parents. We're supposed to obey our parents. But that does not mean that you just have to make all the same mistakes as your parents. And we see there was a generation in America that wholeheartedly just does not seek the Lord, that turned away from the Lord, that decided to have a mass exodus from many of God's instructions from the clear Bible. And look, you should honor and obey your parents, but you do not have to make the same mistakes. Be not like your fathers if they transgressed against the Lord. If they've gone against God's commandments, if they've done wrong, if they've done wickedly, love your parents, but do not follow after their ways. Follow the Bible. Do what the Bible says. Don't go and follow a multitude to do evil. No, do what's right according to the Bible. Right. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 14. Now, lo, if he beget a son, that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, that he hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, and hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet ye say, why? Doth he not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. According to the Bible, a son does not have to take recompense for all of the father's actions. Now, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, children do receive uh, recourse because of their parents' actions. What their parents decide to do, how their parents decide to raise them, they're going to suffer or be blessed based on those decisions. But according to the Bible, God is not a respecter of persons, and God is not going to impute your father's iniquity unto you. He's going to judge you based on your actions. And we see here an example of a father that was doing a lot of bad stuff. He said, look, they're, they're doing adultery, they're exacting usury, they're not following my statutes, they're not following my judgments, they're just like wholeheartedly just not following the Bible. I mean, just almost in every way. They're not giving money to the poor, they're not doing any of these things right. Look, you need to do all of those things right. Not just get half of them right, not just, oh, well, we just won't commit adultery. But we'll still do the usury, you know, we still will forsake His commandments. No, you need to get it all right. You need to follow all of God's commandments. And we see even if your parents, even if the whole world, even if a whole generation is doing evil, that should not affect what you do. This is what should affect what you do. This should be our light unto our feet. The lamp that guides us in life. Go to Psalms chapter 106. So the first point that I have this evening about how parents have outsourced their responsibilities is that they've outsourced the responsibility of teaching their children. Now, I preached a lot of sermons recently about this. I, I'm going to try and uh, go to some different scriptures. Go to Psalms 106. I'll read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Especially the day that thou sittest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says that parents are to teach their children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently right. unto thy children. Diligent. That means consistently. That means over and over. You have a planned, dedicated effort into teaching your children. It's not a whim. It's not, well, every once in a while when we go out on a Saturday, I might talk about the sky and kind of talk about science a little bit. No, you have a plan. You're diligent. You may, uh, you're going to execute that plan. It's not just a whim. You're making a plan on purpose to educate and to teach and to train your children. And you're making sure they get it. 
You're not just trying it. No, you're making sure they understand. You're repeating your patient. One thing, it's very difficult to teach a child to read. It takes a lot of diligence. I mean, you're like, A, B, no, A, A, can you say A with me? Hey, no, A, A, what is this letter? A, it's just over, it's repetitive, it's constant. Look, it takes a lot of patience. You know what, it's worth it. Why would I, why would I not want to teach my children? Why would I want my children to be stupid? I don't want that. I want my children to be smart, and I'm going to take the time to teach them diligently. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 11, And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The Bible says, look, you should be constantly teaching your children. We see a lot of people today, they just give it to the public school to teach their children. They literally do not teach their children ever. Right. The only instruction they ever get is from the public school system it's from some other educator, from some person that doesn't even believe the Bible, somebody that doesn't want to teach the Bible, that says we need to learn things abstract from the Bible, we need to be politically correct, we need everybody to feel special and, you know, gifted and helped, and, you know, even if your child's smart and can get things very quickly, we're going to learn very slow just so everybody's on the same page. Or, in the case that your children's very slow, maybe they have to rush through things for them. But it's not accommodating the child, it's trying to accommodate the masses, which basically accommodates nobody. Nobody really gets accommodated. The state gets accommodated. They get all the money from all the, the teachers. Yep. Look at Psalms 106, verse 32. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so they went ill with Moses for their sakes, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. So we see here the children of Israel, they do very wicked. They do what we would know as uh, today's abortion. In verse 37, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. Yeah, that, that devil down at Planned Parenthood that'll go and murder babies. The abortion doctor, he's a devil. And they're taking their babies down there to get murdered. They're killing their, their children. You say, what could cause a person to kill their own child? Well, what did it say in verse 35? But they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. If you put a kid in the public full system today, if you raise your kid based on the world, they're going to train them to murder their own children. You say, well, that's not our values. That's not our beliefs. Me and my wife, we don't feel that way. Yeah, but you're not teaching them. You're outsourcing it to the public full system. And they're going to say, oh, you're 14, you're 15, you're 16. You can't raise that kid. You don't know what you're doing. You need to just get rid of it. You need to just take care of it. And they're going to learn their works, and they're going to do their works. You say, how could a person do this? You're outsourcing that education. You're outsourcing it to another person, and they teach them this wickedness. To shed innocent blood, it's murder, according to the Bible, if you kill your own child. It says that they were defiled with their own works. They went a whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, and so much that he abhorred his own, his own inheritance. So look, they're learning all this wicked stuff. Where are they getting it? They're getting it from the heathen. And if you send your kid to the public full system, you will learn the ways of the heathen, and many of them will be corrupted and learn their works. I don't want my children to learn the works of the heathen, to learn the works of those that are going to teach them, hey, you need to murder your child. Hey, you need to worship other gods. Hey, you need to go out and whore around and be a whore with all kinds of different people. No, you need to love the Lord God. You need to serve the Lord God. You need to think that life is precious and never murder your own children. That's what the Bible teaches. We see so many parents today, they just send their kids to the public school system, and when their kid comes home just believing all kinds of weird junk, doing all kinds of weird junk, it's like, what, where did that come from? Well, it didn't, it didn't uh, just come out of nowhere. It was learned by somebody else. 
Children are like sponges. They're going to learn. And if you don't teach them, somebody else will. If you don't teach your children about this world, they'll learn it from their friends, they'll learn it from their teachers, they'll, worst of all, they can learn it online. I mean, the internet's filled with all kinds of junk. And if you don't teach your children, if you're not filling that sponge, they're going to gather from all the wrong places. Go to Nehemiah chapter 13. And you say, when did abortion, you know, really come into play in America? Well, it says in 1973 was the landmark decision in Roe versus Wade where abortion came in to America, where it became legal. 1973. That's a date to start, you know, get set in our brain. There's a lot of things that happened in the 70s. There's a lot of things that happened in that generation where people are doing a mass exodus against the Lord, where they're just forsaking all the ways of the Lord. Daniel chapter 1 verse 4 it says, Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning, and knowledge, and understanding science, and such as has ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So in the Bible, we had, you know, the Babylonians came and they took all the wisest of the children, and they were trying to teach them the ways of the heathen. Now it's possible for a godly person, even in that environment, to still serve the Lord. But you know what? I don't want to subject, subject my children to that and just hope that they're an angel. Just hope that they're the one out of the thousand that you know is going to actually decide to choose to serve the Lord. Obviously, there's choice. I want to be the one that's in control, and I'm going to train my child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. But look at Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23. In those days also saw I G the Wow, sorry. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And the children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet many, yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved as God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause a sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God and marrying strange wives? So we see here it's an interesting uh, sentence there in verse 24 which says, And could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. So they were speaking in some of the Ashdod and some in the Jewish language. They didn't really know one language, they kind of knew both. And I think this is a good example of you don't need one good parent, you need two good parents. You need a godly man and a godly woman to instruct the children. You don't want to learn both ways. You know, and it's just as important, it's probably more important for my wife to be godly than me in a lot of ways. Because my children spend more time with my wife than with me. Now obviously as me being the one that's supposed to lead and to guide her, me being godly can help her to be more godly, to serve the Lord, to be more faithful unto the Lord. But at the end of the day, I can't be godly enough for the both of us. I can't be the one that makes sure that our children turn out right by myself. I need my wife to be godly. I need my wife to serve the Lord. I need my wife to train up the children. I need my wife to be there to guide and to train them, to not outsource it to the public school system. No, God gave me a wife for a reason to be a helpmate unto me. To be a help me, help me raise the children. Help me instruct the children. Help me teach the children. Help me love and nourish the children. You know, it's not, you know, why do so many pastors, their children turn out bad? You say, man, that guy's a pastor. You know, I mean, he loves the Lord. He's serving the Lord. I think, honestly, it's probably because their wife is not serving the Lord. It's not good enough just for the guy to serve the Lord. He needs a godly woman by his side to be home raising the children, guiding the children, disciplining the children, teaching the children, being there with the children. It's my job to make sure that my wife is doing a good job with the children. Saying, hey, you know, what are you teaching the children? What are they learning? What are we doing? Are you being diligent with the children? Because I can't be there all the time. I have to go out and provide for my family. I have to do a lot of other things. So I need to make sure that my wife's doing a good job. Not because I need to be a lord over her, because I hate her, because I don't like... No. 
It's important for both of us to be a good example of our children because we both love our children. We want our children to be raised right. I don't want them to learn half of God's word and half of the heathen. I don't want them to you know, go in church on Sunday and then as soon as they go in the afternoon, they're watching the TV. And they're watching all the filth online and they're just going out and they learn both. No, I want it to be all Bible. I want it to be all the Lord. Yeah. All on the righteous path. Learning, you know, the whole Jew language. I don't, they don't need to learn Ashdod. Nobody speaks Ashdod. <laughs> Go if you would to Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says in Exodus 34, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. Their daughters go a-whoring after their gods. And make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Look, who you marry is a very important decision. You need to make sure that you marry a godly person. A person that loves the Lord. A person that's saved. Because they're going to affect your children whether like you like it or not. You know, that was probably one of the, if not the number one reason that I wanted to marry my wife. You said, what was the number one thing you were looking for? Was it just, just the best looking? The, you know, the best singing voice? You know, the best cook? Honestly, when I thought about it, I just wanted someone that was going to love my children and be a good mother unto my children. I got all those extra ones as bonus. You know, all those other things are, you know, icing on the cake. But I knew when I, when I would see my wife interact with my nieces and nephews, when I'd see her interact with other people, when, I, when we would talk about the Bible, I knew this woman is going to love her children. She's going to care for her children. That, you know, she fought with me. I'll confess my fault unto you. She fought with me because she wanted to always stay home with the children all the time. Even, even if they did go to school. She would always be there, always be willing to teach them, always be willing to be with them. And I was kind of like, yeah, but you can still work some. And, you know, maybe go back and get some more money and, you know, work. And I had to have a change of mind to realize that's not important. I can, you know, I, even if I don't even make good money, I'd rather my wife be with my children all the time than to outsource this as a responsibility for them to learn the ways of the heathen. So, yeah, but what about college? Don't you want him to go to college? Get a really good education? I wonder if Timothy, you know, what Timothy thought after Paul instructed him. He said, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. You think Paul was saying, Timothy, you need to go get philosophy 101 at the college down the street. No, he said, You need to avoid that place. Yeah. Don't even go anywhere near it. Avoid all this vain and profane babbling. Right. And that's what the professors are like. Professing to say yep. to be wise, they became fools. And they just babble and self glorify. They're the most arrogant, prideful pricks on the planet. Right. It's a professor, a college professor. They love themselves. Yeah. They love to hear themselves talk. And you know what? They just talk foolishness, they don't talk the wisdom of God's word. And they're instructing so many people in the ways of the heathen. The ways against God. Amen. They hate God. They preach all kinds of filth and wickedness and blasphemy. You know, there might be a godly professor somewhere, but I don't really know. And all the professors that I ever had, that I've ever met, they're some of the most arrogant, prideful people. Yep. God hates the proud. God does not respect the proud. Yeah. He resists the proud. Look at Revelation chapter 2. We see it's important where you learn stuff. Look at verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them... That hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So we see here the doctrine of Balaam. He's teaching the children of Israel to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. We need to be careful. Who we're learning stuff from? Oh, I need to go to Bible college. Oh, what? So you can learn how to commit fornication? So you can learn how to eat meat sacrificed unto idols? Like Balaam taught? You know, he, he was a prophet. He proclaimed himself to be a prophet of the Lord. What was he teaching? 
False doctrine. Yep. Guy wasn't even saved. Go to a lot of these Bible colleges, the professors aren't even saved. And they right. teach doctrines of devils. Right. They teach all kinds of wicked, you know, satanic filth. They're not teaching the Bible. They're not teaching God's Word. Right. Look, I don't want my kids to go to public college. I don't even want them to go to Bible college. That's probably even worse. They're going to learn, you know, even worse filth. Worse things that will get them in green. You see that parents, though, they want to ship them off to college. They want to outsource all of the education to the world. They don't want to teach them literally anything. And you know, this is not the way the world used to work. For a majority of history, children would learn the trade of their father. They would just do... Their last name was often what they did. Smith? Hey, he was a blacksmith. You know, I mean, whatever their last name was, a lot of times was the work that they did, and their son did it, their son did it. I mean, we even see with Jesus Christ, they're like, is this not the carpenter's son? And then another gospel, they're saying, isn't this guy the carpenter? I mean, they're like, hey, whatever your dad did, that's probably what you're going to do. Why? Because that's what the Bible's always taught. That's what people have constantly done. It's just in the last few hundred years where you see people going really far against what the Bible teaches. Where they want to get them lumped in these schools and teach them all the wisdom of the government, teach them the wisdom of the heathen and the Chaldeans and the language of Ashdod, and teach them all this filth, get them on Balaam's program, all this false doctrine. That's not what the Bible teaches. Not only should we not just outsource our public education, like math, science, reading, arithmetic, all these things, but even people, they'll... they'll outsource their spiritual education. They won't even teach their children the Bible. Church is where they learn the Bible. Church is where they learn about God. Church is where they hear the Bible read to them. Or their youth group. Or their Sunday school class. How many parents never open their Bible and sit their kids down and read the Bible to them and explain the Bible to them? I mean, even if they do, it's very rare. That's sad. You really think you sired this child, you're going to have them for at least 18, 19, 20 years, and you're never just going to open the Bible and explain the Bible to them. But we see so many parents today, they're outsourcing this job. Go to Jeremiah chapter 28. You know, I was raised in a Christian home. I think the only time that my parents ever even opened the Bible was on Christmas Eve. And we'd read Luke chapter 2. You know, we'd read the Christmas story. We'd read, you know, just a... We wouldn't even read the whole chapter because it's a pretty long chapter. We'd just read, like, the first little bit of it, you know? Just a few verses here or there. That was, like, the only... And there was no explanation. There was no talking about it. Just, like, let's just kind of read a few verses. I mean, how can you say that that's what the Bible's telling you to do? Look at Jeremiah 28, verse 15. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. You know, the Bible says that there's many false prophets that are gone out of the world. Most preachers, most pastors, most instructors of the Bible are false. So if you're only relying on them to teach your children... There's a lot of odds stacked up against them. That they're teaching them rebellion against the Lord. Not the ways of the Bible. Not what the Bible clearly teaches. Not what they should be instructed in. A lot of, of, of these prophets are teaching rebellion. And if you don't know the Bible, if you're not instructing your children, there's going to be a lot of times they learn false doctrine. You know, I learned a lot of false doctrines growing up in church. A ton of, you know, pre-trib, you know, stuff. A lot of false uh, doctrine about money. A lot, all kinds of false doctrines, okay? How did I get that? Did my parents ever teach me anything? No. That's a shame. No, obviously you should go to a Bible-believing church where the pastor does teach you a lot of good things, where you can learn a lot from the man of God. You know, the primary instruction should be coming from the parents, I believe. The parents should be making sure their children know what the Bible says because they're teaching it to them. Not because somebody else is teaching them. Don't outsource your children's spiritual education to somebody else. You should know the Bible. You should read the Bible. You should instruct your children in the Bible. That's how you have safety. You have, a, you have a safety when you know the Bible and you're teaching it to your children. Not only this, people outsource it just to tutors. Or, you know, they'll just hire some other person to their children. Not even themselves. Now, I'm not against, you know, maybe you have a big family. Let your own children teach your own children some. I mean, that's a great resource to have. You know, you, you can uh, you learn so much better 
when you teach others. Have you ever, you know, uh, had to teach somebody something that you weren't really, you know, that sure of when you first started out? But after you taught it to them, after you took the time to, to plan your lesson and really learn, you're like, man, now I really know it. Because I taught it to this guy. You have to know something to be able to teach it. If you don't know something, you can't teach. So, so it's important. This a lot of times even have children teaching the other children. It's good tools. It's a good way. Don't bring in some other third party. Don't bring in some other tutor that needs to be instructing your children. Parents are so afraid to teach your children, children education. Look, if, if you can't teach it to them, you need to learn it. You shouldn't just be stupid and doltish and sottish like all the people that God's cursing and saying it's a curse to be like. No, you should learn it too. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. There's a lot of ways that we need to be instructing our children, that we need to be teaching our children. And we see today, parents are outsourcing this completely. They say, as soon as I'm done with school, I never want to learn anything again, and I never want to teach anybody anything. I'm done. I just want to get on my phone and just watch movies and sit back. I'll let the school teach my children. And guess what? Your children are going to be wicked. They're going to hate the Lord. They're going to learn all the ways of the, the heathen. They're going to murder their own children. And then later, they might even murder you. That's what the Bible's teaching. It's not, it, it, I mean, it's, it's sad. It's sad to think that people can have, you know, God will give them a gift of a child, and they don't even care enough to just teach it anything. They teach it nothing. I would resent my parents, too, if they just were that, you know, wicked and not even teach me anything. Now, of course, my parents did teach me a lot of things and did spend time with me, but they could have done better. You know, and I, I, I appreciate a lot of things that my parents taught me, but I'm not going to follow their example because it doesn't match up with what the Bible says. I'm going to try and match up with what the Bible says. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things have pertained to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge or at least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brethren go to, to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Like another way that people will sometimes outsource their responsibilities is their kids are kind of having problems. The kids are kind of struggling. So they'll send them to a counselor. Or, you know, maybe you have problems in the world and you go seek a lawyer. You go let a lawyer, you know, judge your matters, figure out what's right. This is a wicked thing to do. I would rather that the most least esteemed person in Faith or Baptist Church would give counsel unto my children rather than some just counselor out in the world. That's going to teach them Sigmund Freud's, you know, wicked yeah. worldly philosophies. Right. Teaching them, oh, you don't feel good? Take this drug. Oh, you don't feel special every second? Oh, you did something wrong and somebody told you no? That's not right. You know, you need to feel special all the time. And you need to feel entitled. And you need to get, you know, a pat on your back. And we need to, you know, make everybody feel good. And we need to sing Kumbaya. And, you know, if your boss at work tells you wrong, you can sue him. You know, you can sue him for harassment. And you can sue him for, you know, wrongful termination. I mean, this is what the world thinks today. They just go out and seek worldly, you know, godless counsel that that's going to fix their problems is not going to fix your problems. You need to get a kick in the pants by the least esteemed brother in the church. Hey, go to work. Shut your mouth. Do what the boss says. No, obey your parents. Hey, if you do wrong, you know, it's not going to break your head. Receive it with a little oil of gladness. Let it drip down on your beard like Aaron. You know, and the Bible's saying, look, don't seek the world's counsel. I'm not going to ship my kids to some worldly counselor to get filled with drugs and get more problems. They're not going to get better. They're going to get worse. Like the woman that was seeking cure from the physicians. Yep. She was worse after she spent all her money. That's what you're going to do with these, you know, godless counselors. Right. You're going to waste all your money because they're expensive. Man, are those counseling sessions expensive? And it's not going to make you better. It's going to make you worse. People walk in there kind of confused. They leave even more confused. They don't even know what to think. And now they're on drugs. Now they're not even sober. I mean, it's just, a, it's just wicked. It's never going to help. Let's go to my next point. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So not only are parents today outsourcing 
all of the things that they're teaching their children. In a lot of ways, they're outsourcing just work in general. They're just outsourcing the role of a parent to provide for their children. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. According to the Bible, the right to eat is not granted. The right to eat is by you working, by you going out and providing for yourself. We see a lot of people today, they feel entitled to food. So we have these programs like WIC. Who knows what I'm talking about? WIC. You go to the Walmart today, and they have these big pink labels, they'll say WIC. It's where people just get free food. Uh, it says in uh, Psalms 37, verse 25, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread. According to the Bible, the righteous are not begging for bread. They're not in constant want. No, they're working hard and they're providing for themselves. They're not even doing that. They're providing for others many times. They have so much abundance coming in because they're working so hard that they can bless and help the poor. That they can help you know, those that are in need too. We see this WIC program. Let me give you the date that it started on. It says an amendment to Section 17 of the Child Nutrition Act of 1966 was ratified on September 26, 1972. So what was that first day? 1973 abortion is instituted. This WIC program was instituted in 1972. It says that uh, all participants must be deemed at nutritional risk and with inadequate income. However, what constituted inadequate income was not defined. So they basically, WIC stands for Women, Infants, and Children. And it's a program that was run by the state to just basically give free food to these people. Because they just, they just earned it. Just because they're a woman, they're an infant, they're a child. If you're a man, well, sorry, too bad you're a man. I mean, we, they talk about how men are so, you know, so privileged. They have all these things given to them. Being a white male, I have no extra privileges, no extra special, you know, programs just made for me. There's all kinds of programs for women, and infants, and ch Hey, just being a woman, you can qualify for this program. And so they get food stamps or... They have Medicaid, they have AFDAC participation. Basically, they just qualify and they can show their card and they can get all time, kinds of food and uh, things at the store just free. They just walk in and they get it completely free. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people on these programs, they don't even need the stuff. They just get all of the free stuff and then they sell it. They just go out into the world and they just, they'll get all this formula. They don't even have a baby. They'll just get all these, because formula's expensive. Man, you buy one of those things of formula, it's like 50 bucks. And you can get like three or four of them a month for free. So they get like, you know, $200 worth of formula, and then they're just selling it for like 80 cents on the dollar. So they can get an extra $160 for their booze money, or for them to go out and gamble, or buy lottery tickets. It says in December 2000, the White House issued an executive memorandum authorizing the WIC program to begin screening clients for childhood immunization status. So when it started out, this WIC program, they were just getting people and they were just giving them free food. They are just giving them the free stuff from the stores. They are just buying it. But then they were like, well, now that we're just giving them all this free stuff, maybe we can require some things of them. So now they're starting to require that children vaccinate their children to qualify for this program. So now they have some control. Look, you, nothing's free. Nothing is just given to you for free. They're saying, hey, we'll give you free food if you, you know, stab your kid with a needle, with drugs, with poison. Hey, if you poison your kids and you kill your kids, we'll give them free food. What a deal! That's horrible. That's wicked. And we see this WIC program, it's just giving, you know, food to people that don't need it, don't deserve it. It says in uh, their roles, that it says this is the primary roles of WIC. Number one. To find out about a child's need for immunization and share that information with parents. Number two, to carry out minimum immunization screening and referral protocols not replacing the state immunization program responsibilities. Number three, to implement other measures to increase immunization rates of WIC children. It didn't even mention food. It says the three roles of WIC is to vaccinate kids. And you can, oh, it's such a great program. They're just trying to feed the poor and help them out. No, they're basically ruining them by teaching them it's okay not to work. 
That these people can just, they're just entitled food. They don't even have to try and provide for themselves. They can just get knocked up with whoever for wherever, and then the government gets to poison all their children. That's their goal. That's their three roles to figure out all their immunization stats. It says in the 2009 to 2016, the funding for this program has been between six and seven billion dollars every year. And it says the participation rate from 2008 to 2012 and 12 has been about 8 to 9 million people every single year. So you see this is not affecting just a few people. It's affecting many people. The Bible says in, Exodus, in Titus chapter 2 verse 5 that women are to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Why are these women doing this? So that they can just, you know, not have a husband, not be a keeper at home, so that they can just go and whore around, do whatever they want, and still get food. And still get provided for. They let, the, they let their daddy be the government. They let their daddy be these institutions. You know, it makes me think of uh, the children of Israel in Egypt. You see, Joseph, after they had run out of the you know, money to buy the food, they basically went on wick. Where, where the, you know, he's just giving them food, but he's mortgaging the lands, he's taking all their goods, and then what happens? He's like, wow, there's a lot of people here. You know, we're just feeding these people and they're just multiplying. So, you know what we need to do? We need to kill their children. And they started telling the Hebrew midwives to kill the children. What do we see Americans doing? Hey, they're trying to kill them through vaccination. That's what their real goal is. That's what their real motive is. They're trying to kill the children. But young ladies today, they need to learn how to keep house. And if they don't go out and spread their legs and have all these children without a wedlock, they're going to go from their dad's house to their husband's house. They don't need the WIC program. They don't need the state government to get involved. And you know, if a woman does find herself in a bad situation, go back to her dad. Go back and obey her father. Go back and find a family member, a godly man to submit unto and let him provide for you. The Bible says that if a man provide not for his own, he is worse than an infidel, is what the Bible says. So men are supposed to take care of the ladies, not the government. It's a man's responsibility to be the one to feed women. And the Bible says, look, the godly women, they're not the ones begging bread. They're not the ones going without. It's the whoremongers and the whores and the adulteresses and those that want to live of this world. Go to Proverbs chapter 22. You know, women today, they want to outsource all working. And you know, as a, as a woman, it's not her job to go out and provide all the money. But what is her job? How about cooking meals? But you know, women today, they want to do that. They want to just go get the fast food. They just want to go go to the restaurants. They just want to have somebody else prepare the food. They don't want to clean. They want to get a maid service. Or they just want to let their house get filthy. They just won't clean. They just sit around and do nothing. The Bible says that the Proverbs woman, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. You know, women today, they don't want to do the laundry or their clothes. They'll just buy new clothes. They'll just go to Walmart and buy the dollar clothes just so they don't have to do their own laundry, take care of the clothes. You know, because if you don't launder the clothes, if you don't take care of them, they wear out quickly. They'll wear spots, they'll get dirty, and then they just throw them away and buy new ones. I mean, you go to the thrift store, and it's full of all these just garbage clothes. Why? Because people aren't taking care of them. People are just constantly going through and in and out and just buying new clothes. The Bible says that the, the virtuous woman, it says she's not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. You know, the virtuous woman, she's making clothing for her family. She's not trying to find the most expensive clothing and she's going to take care of it, I guarantee. I bet if you take all the time to make that garment, you're going to make sure it gets washed and you're going to look well to those ways. You're going to say, I really like that you know, garment that I made. I'm going to take care of it. The husband, he doesn't even have to go worry about it, does he? He just He's going to look good no matter what because his wife's going to take care of that for him. We see that it's the wife's responsibility. And you know, when a wife doesn't do this, the daughters learn not to do it. The daughters learn, hey, I don't need to learn how to cook. I don't need to learn how to clean. I don't need to learn how to take care of my husband and do well unto my husband. And when they don't see that model, when they don't see that woman working hard and they outsource all these things, then the children suffer. The children suffer when the mother is not a hard worker. 
When the mother's not taking care of her family. When the mother just says, well, the government will just take care of us. Let's just go down and get our WIT card, and we'll get our free clothes and our free food, and we'll, we'll scam the system, and we'll just sit around and be lazy and go get our McDonald's, and get our, just get whatever we can, whatever junk food we can for free. This is not how we're going to raise a godly children. This is how your children will rise up and hate you. They'll love the government. The government takes care of me. The government's my, you know, protector. The government's the one that's looking well on me. My parents, they can care less. They're, they're, just, they're just sitting around just enjoying life. The Bible says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Hey, you want to be a servant? Then just borrow. Then just be lazy. Look, the person who makes the money makes the rules. I'm not saying that we should desire to be rich. We should desire to, you know, accumulate a lot of wealth on this world. But according to the Bible, as a man, you're supposed to provide your house. You're supposed to take care of your house. You're supposed to have money to take care of other people, take care of the poor. That's a godly man. A godly man is one that can provide for his house, take care of his house. And we see the godly woman, she's doing all that she can to help her husband. You know, it's expensive to go out and just go to restaurants all the time. To just constantly, if your wife never cooks, that's going to be expensive. If your wife never cleans, that's going to be expensive. If your wife's not looking for deals and taking care of the house and, and finding the clothing and, and taking care of all these things, look, I never want to go shopping again if I don't have to. Now I'm going to because my wife loves shopping and I'll just go with her. But look, if I never had to buy another clothing article for myself again, I would be, I would be fine with that. I can let my wife buy clothes for me. That's great. But she does a lot of great things for me. A godly woman can help her husband. We see even with men, I, I'm going to skip it for sake of time, but we see men today, because of all these things, they're even forsaking work. The United States is third worst in men participation rate in labor among developed countries in the world. Amongst all the developed countries, all the countries that are kind of the same economic status, the United States is third worst and number of men going into the workforce. You know what number one country is in the world? The worst male participation rate? Israel. Israel is the worst participation rate of men going out and working. Interesting fact. This is why they say, this article, this is the reasons they provide. Number one, wives in the workforce. Women going to work. That's the number one reason. And you know, I even work with a, a lady who her husband stays home and she says, well, I have to work to be able to provide for both of us. If he went out and worked, he wouldn't make as much money, and then we couldn't pay for, for child care. We couldn't pay for daycare. Hey, newsflash, if you're home, you can watch the kids. You can go and make the meals. You can clean the house. You can do all these things. You know, the man's supposed to be the one going out and working hard and providing for the family, not backwards. It says the second thing, oh, government assistance programs. Oh, I think I remember... You know, talking about that, WIC, we see men won't even go to work because these programs are providing for their women, providing for their, you know, women on the side. They're not married, you know. <laughs> their girlfriend's taking good care by WIC. Well, I don't need to, you know, provide for her. I don't need to do anything. Why even get married? It says less blue-collar jobs. You know, that's pretty, you know, speculative, but they're just saying there's less blue-collar jobs. There's pretty much more high-end jobs and there's low-end jobs. Well, it sounds like I need to get some smarts then. Sounds like I need to get some skills. If they're eliminating all this, you know, middle layer work, if I don't want to work at, you know, McDonald's for $15 an hour, then I better get a real job. You know, it's going to, if, if that continues, if the government continues pushing this minimum wage, it's going to destroy a lot of the middle class jobs. It's going to basically be, you know, the rich and the poor. Well, if I have that choice, why don't I be smart? Why don't I get some skills? Why don't I work hard and have a good paying job? Be somebody that's desirable. Number four, incarcerations. <laughs> I mean, we're just putting a lot of people in prison. Let's just face it. So many guys are just going to prison in America. It's wicked. I read for you, but it says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's harsh language. <laughs> I'm not saying you're worse than an unbeliever. You're worse than someone that's not even saved if you're not providing your house. Men need to provide for their family. Let's go to the last point. Go to Lamentations chapter 4. The Bible says that the aged women likewise, that they being behavior has become with holiness, not false <coughs> accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. The last way that I think parents outsource, you know, their responsibilities, but not only they're not teaching their children, 
Not only they're not working hard, they're outsourcing a lot of their work, they outsource their time. And this is probably one of the worst things that you could see. You see, so many parents, they put their kids in daycare. They put them in child care services. They don't even want to have their kids around them. And, you know, daycare is with little kids. When they're probably the most vulnerable to wickedness, the most vulnerable to type of things, when they're establishing many of the beliefs and the uh, characteristics that they're going to have for the rest of their life. Limitations chapter 4, verse 1. And look at verse 3. Even the sea monsters draw up the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the root of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaketh under them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. The Bible says, look, even the sea monsters draw up the breast. Saying, <laughs> look, the person that cares the most about your children is you. If you're going to get one thing from the sermon, the one thing that's the most important about this is a parent is the most influential person in a child's life. He, makes, he has the biggest impact on their child's life. And why in the world would I just want to give that to somebody else? If God has blessed me with a child, why would I want to outsource that to other people? No, I should be the one that's giving them the time. I should be the one that's teaching them. I should be the one that's working hard for my children. The Bible says the rod and the reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You know, a lot of parents, TV has become their new, day, their new daycare. Oh, just set them in front of Disney. Just set them in front of some movies. Hey, I'll just go do my thing all day, and you can just watch TV, watch the Disney Channel, watch cartoons, watch the internet, do whatever you want. They're not even spending a time with their children. It says, uh, in 1971, the Comprehensive Child Development Act was passed by Congress. It says uh, that Richard Nixon actually vetoed it, though. He says it would have created nationally funded child care centers providing early childhood services and after-school care, as well as nutrition, counseling, and even medical and dental care. So in 1971, the government wanted to create these huge daycare institutions, all these institutes. It's not enough for them to have the kids at school all day. They need them before school. They need them after school, maybe on the weekend. Look, we just want your kids full time. We want them to learn the, the learning of the astronauts, you know, the language of the astronauts, all the time. And today, we see that it's worked. A lot of people are doing this. In 1975, only a generation ago, more than half of all children had a stay-at-home parent. And it says usually the mother. But today, fewer than one in three children today have a full-time stay-at-home parent. So we see a large exodus from 1975 to now. We see this generation before us forsook the ways of the Lord. They forsook being a parent and many of them are not doing what the Bible is teaching. They're letting it go to somebody else. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 3. Uh, another statistic it says almost one quarter of children under the age of five are in some form of organized child care arrangement, which includes daycare centers, nurseries, and preschools. This includes one third of those with an employed mother, and more than one quarter of those whose mothers are not employed but are in school. So this is affecting a lot of children. A lot of children, a lot of young babies, they're not getting time with their children. The parents drop them off at the daycare in the morning. Then they go to school in the day. Then they go to the after school program. Then they come home and the parents get a babysitter. And they go out at, at night. And then the kids go to bed. They never even see their kids. They never even talk to their kids. They're not teaching their children. They're not even, you know, working with their children, showing their kids how to work. They're not spending any time with their children. And if you don't spend time with somebody, you're not going to develop a relationship. You say, man, I want to be a better friend with that person. you got to spend time with them. Hey, I want to have a better relationship with my spouse. you got to spend time with them. I want a better relationship with the Lord. Amen. you got to spend time with the Lord. you got to spend time to develop a relationship. I want to have a good relationship with my children. Hey, you got to spend time with them. Hey, why do those kids want to rise up and slay their parents? They weren't spending time with their kids. They weren't teaching their kids. Look at verse Kings chapter uh, 3, verse 23. Then said the king, The one saith, This my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and the half to the other. 
Then spake the woman who the child, living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine or thine, but divide it. We see, the heart of a mother is always going to do the best thing for the child. Why? Nobody loves your child as much as you. It's not even close. Not your grandparents. Not your uncle. Not your aunt. Nobody. Not your friend. Especially not the, the government. Especially not, you know, some daycare. Right. Not some college. They don't care about your children. They don't love your children. Go to 3 John chapter 1. Go to 3 John. That's where we'll finish. You know, we shouldn't even get babysitters. The Bible says in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Like if you're hiring people to raise your kids, they don't care. They, they're going to flee when trouble comes. They're not going to do that which is right. Look, it says that he careth not for the sheep. Why is he watching your kids for money? Look, people don't like watching other people's kids. Let, let, me, let me just help you out. I do not want to watch your children. You know why people do it? For money. That's why they, Not because they care. Not because, they, oh, I just love the children. Oh, yeah. Is that why all the teachers have all these red for ed signs? Because they love the children so much? Nope. No, they love money. Yep. They're money grubbing. They don't love the children. They don't care for the children. They care not for the sheep. They care for their own belly. These after school programs, these sports programs, other family activities. Look, parents just want to get rid of their kids. Go play basketball. Go get in the YMCA. Go in the after school program. Get a babysitter. Get the daycare. Get out of my life. And you know what's going to happen? The kids are going to rise up and they're going to slay their parents. They're going to hate their parents. They're going to despise their parents. We need to realize we have the most important role in our child's life. We need not just outsource everything to everybody else. We need to be the ones to teach our children. We need to be the ones that are working hard for our children. And you know what? We need to spend time with our children. You want your children to love you? You have to spend time with them. Look at 3 John chapter 1, verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know how you get really good joy in your life? Seeing your children raised for the Lord, loving the Lord, serving the Lord, doing that which is right. How are you going to do that? You have to train up a child in the way he should go. That's how you're going to do it. And that's how you're going to have the greatest joy. Am I going to have the greatest joy by not spending time with my kids and working, you know, going more to my job? Living for the pleasures of, the, of this life. Living for myself. No, I have greater joy for my children to do right. For my children to do things that are... Uh, Godly. I want to sow into my children so I can reap of my children. I'm not saying that we should vicariously live through our children. You know, some people go overboard with that, you know. Obviously, this is talking about the other extreme. We need to have, obviously, God is our number one. We need to make sure that we're setting that example. Hey, I'm getting up and reading my Bible and showing my kids the importance of reading my Bible, of getting, you know, praying, going to church, serving the Lord. And when they see that precedence, when they see that example, they can follow that example. Hey, I need to be teaching them the Bible too. Not just for myself. It's not important for me to just learn the Bible. I need my whole family to learn the Bible. You know, I need to be working hard to provide for them. And I need to be spending the time with them. Because I have the single most uh, impact on my children. Why would God give you a child? For you to just waste it. For you to just squander it. He gave you a soul. A living soul. If you have a child, if you have multiple children, He gave you and entrusted you that soul, and you have the most impact over that soul. What's going to happen unto them? You need to punish that child so he won't go to hell. You need to teach him so he can live for God. You need to show him how to work hard so that he will work hard. And you need to spend time with that child so that he'll love you. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you so much that you're always willing to spend time with us and give unto us and to teach us and to work with us. Just thank you so much for your example. I pray that we would not, you know, take lightly the responsibility of a parent. That we would not just outsource this to other people. We would not just give up. We would not give our responsibilities to others. But we would love and enjoy the responsibilities that you give as a parent. We realize the importance of a parent in the role, in the 
in the life of a child. Thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name we pray.